sisters and brothers. Amy Wilson Feltz here. I am the pastor of St. Paul's United Methodist Church in El Paso, Texas, coming to you live from our beautiful sanctuary here in El Paso. Welcome. Again, this is Amy Wilson Feltz, and I'm so glad that you are with me on this beautiful August morning. It is the first Sunday of the month, a day that we traditionally celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion. So we are glad that you are with us today. Cindy, we're glad that you are here. This is our time of virtually passing the peace. So if you wanna let me know that you are here, I would love to greet you and say your name. And you can also greet each other in the comment section as well as we say grace and peace. And also, as you are connecting, we have our Connect form. If you want to know more information about what's going on in the life of our community, you can use our Connect form. We also have our giving link. As I said last week, it can be a little awkward to talk about giving, especially in this format. But if we were here in the sanctuary together, we would have our time of passing of the plate and celebrating the way that God is at work in our mission and the way that our, our giving, our spiritual discipline of giving fuels that mission as well. And so I do wanna let you know that we have a way to give online. If you wish, you can also give using our mobile app on your smartphone. Again, you can search for St. Paul's El Paso. You will see our logo. And then when you download it, you will see information about our sermons and everything else that we are doing throughout the week and month. And also you have the opportunity to select the Give Today option. And you can give a one-time gift or a recurring gift using the same technology that's available on our website. So we appreciate your giving, not only because it fuels our mission, but also because the spiritual discipline of giving is good for our souls. It teaches us to rely on God's provision and it cultivates generosity within us, which is good in all areas of our life. We do want to know that if you give to St. Paul's, you give to our mission of loving God, following Jesus and serving others. And just lately, here are some ways that we've been able to pursue our mission because of your generosity. We were able to make communion elements available in our community last week. We are working on a mission project to write notes of encouragement to our children in our church and in our neighborhood as they prepare for the school year. We will have our annual back to school blessing drive through style on August the 10th. Just a few days earlier, we will have a blood drive here at the church on August the 8th. And those are just a few of the ways that we continue to pursue our mission during this time because of your generosity. So thank you for that. Good morning. Glad that you are here. Hi, Leonard. Hi, Diana. Hi, Terry. We are so glad that you are tuning in today. Good morning, Wendy. I would love to hear from you some of your favorite stories of rest and relaxation because that's where we're moving in our sermon series today. One of my favorite stories of rest and relaxation was a vacation that I took with Jason before the kids were born. It was actually a working vacation for him. He was still working on his doctorate, so he had a residency to complete in Phoenix, but I had the whole week off, and it happened to be my birthday week that year, so I spent the days floating in the lazy river at the resort. I spent the days doing yoga at the spa and reading novels, and it was truly one of the most relaxing times of my life. So I'm grateful for that time, and I would love to hear from you about some of your most relaxing trips as we continue on our spiritual journey, our summer road trip with Jesus this morning. We're actually going to take another walk with Jesus from Galilee to the outskirts on the Mediterranean Sea today, where he gets into an interesting conversation with a woman from the land of Canaan. And so I invite you to prepare your Bibles and turn to Matthew 15 this morning. But before we do so, we do want to go to our God in prayer, not just for our time of worship this morning, but also in recognition that tomorrow is the first anniversary of the mass shooting that took place in our neighborhood, in the neighborhood Walmart, one year ago. So um, I invite you to acknowledge that with me, to offer continued acknowledgement of grief, of outcries of injustice and lament um, as we continue to mourn the lives that were so needlessly taken. 
We also uh, celebrate the work of community that continues to go on. And we want to let you know that there is a prayer vigil planned for tonight, and you can watch that live on the city's page and on the county's page on Facebook. And so we will share that link. Um, but for now, we're going to go to God in prayer, praying for the families, praying for continued work of justice in this world, knowing that we can be a part of that. So please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to you with our hearts still heavy with sorrow and grief over the tragic and violent event that took place in our community one year ago tomorrow. We pray healing for the families who have lost their loved ones. We pray for healing for those who survived the shooting and are reminded of it every day. We pray for healing for our community as we continue to come together in unity and in strength, working to make our world as you, envis as you envision it. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy in this process. We pray that your presence would be felt, that we would be reminded once again that we are not alone, that you are with us, and that you are leading us in your work of justice and grace and mercy in this world. May your great divine love fuel that work within our hearts, in our families, in our city, in the greater community, and in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you for being here as we work through our summer road trip sermon series and also participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion this morning. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Matthew chapter 15, and I will read verses 21 through 28, so you can follow along in your Bibles, or you can close your eyes and listen as I share the Word of God this morning. Hear now the Word of God. So Jesus then left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, the son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. And Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep, of the house of Israel. But the woman came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and sow it to the dog. She said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed immediately. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of God for the people of God. And together we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight this morning, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Several years ago, in the midst of some personal conflict, I made the decision to cease contact with someone whom I loved dearly. So I didn't see that person in person. I didn't answer phone calls. I didn't answer emails. And I'm not saying that I am proud of those choices, and I'm not recommending those choices to you. I'm just vulnerably and transparently sharing with you some choices that I made at that time in my life without justifying my behavior. But one day, several months later, I answered the phone in a new place of work, and the voice on the other end of that phone call belonged to my loved one, the person whom I had been ignoring for quite some time. 
with much kindness and much humility, that person invited me to meet face to face. And I was so caught off guard. I could not get off the phone fast enough. So I declined quickly and I hung up. And I immediately regretted it. Sisters and brothers, I have a confession this morning that might not be a surprise to some of you. Sometimes I have difficulty admitting when I'm wrong. I think I've grown in some areas in my adulthood for sure, but I still have some trouble at times admitting when I am wrong. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that human condition. We probably have different reasons for wanting to be right. I know for me, it's not really thinking that I have all of the answers. It's more wanting to be reliable and dependable and trustworthy so that people will know that I will be there for them and I can serve and lead with a level head at all times. And as a result, somewhere along the way, I created for myself this false narrative that said all of that work of growth needed to happen behind closed doors, that the people didn't need to see me in my growth process. Because it's one thing, at least in my mind, it's one thing to make a mistake and realize it and work through it in my own mind. It's another thing to do that while other people are watching. So in the case of the story that I shared with you this morning, I was alone during the phone call, but other people knew what was going on in my life and the choices that I was making. In the case of Jesus today, he was literally surrounded by people. And we know from our sermon series that that's really not unusual in this part of Jesus' public ministry. Because at this point in the Gospel of Matthew, crowds are following Jesus as he makes his way through the region of Galilee. We read about that last week. He was preaching the good news. He was proclaiming the kingdom of God. He was healing people. And at this point, uh, in this text in Matthew, Jesus has just had a conflict with some religious leaders about what makes a person clean and unclean. And we are told then in verse 21 that he left the area and withdrew, withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So again, the geography can be a little bit confusing. I've included a map for your reference. So Mija can drop that in the contact and the comments so that you can take a look at that this morning. The cities of Tyre and Sidon are in what we would call today Lebanon on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And often when we are told in the gospel narrative that Jesus withdraws to a region, the implication is that he is seeking respite, that he's seeking some rest and relaxation. And that's why we're calling the sermon rest and relaxation today. But as we know, uh, Jesus' fame was spreading quickly, and so when he withdrew, the, the crowds generally found him, and he was uh, continuing to work and heal and preach, even in those times where he was seeking rest. It was unusual for him to have a moment alone. So, so far in our summer road trip series, Jesus has taken us from Jerusalem, where he called his first travel companions, to Galilee, where they attended a wedding and spent some time with his friends and family, back to Jerusalem, where they celebrated the Passover festival, and then back to Galilee, where Jesus again begins preaching and teaching and healing people and making a name for himself um, in that region. So today we go from Galilee to the outskirts, to the region of Tyre and Sidon. These cities clearly lay beyond the symbolic boundaries of the land of Israel. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus tells his disciples not to go there. But it's also not unusual for the people of Israel to withdraw outside to the margins um, after experiencing a conflict, such as the one that Jesus encountered with the religious leader. So that's what's happening. He's had this conflict, and now he's withdrawing to the margins to gather himself and to prepare for the rest of his ministry. So our text for today in Matthew chapter 15 tells us that in this process Jesus is approached by a Canaanite woman. So right away the writer of Matthew is telling us that this woman is not a Jew like Jesus and the disciples are. 
She's actually a descendant of the people in the land of Canaan. So what that means is her people were displaced by the Israelites when they took the land of Canaan, the holy land, the promised land, by force. It is a problematic and complicated history of the people of God that begins with the promise of God to Abraham to make of him a great nation, and then the promise later to give the people a land flowing with milk and honey. And honestly, sisters and brothers, we could spend hours, days, weeks, months, even years working through those details with much grace uh, and mercy and humility. But for today, it's important at the very least to acknowledge that this scene between Jesus and the woman is set in a backdrop of centuries, centuries of cultural, ethnic, political, economic, and religious conflict. That's the background to our story today, to the point that pretty much all contact between the two people groups had ceased whenever possible. But that does not stop this woman from approaching Jesus as any mother would do, because her child is sick. Her child is possessed, tormented by demons, she says. Imagine this woman's desperation as she is walking up to Jesus, walking alongside Jesus, trying to give him the details, her voice rising in an attempt to be heard, and he does not acknowledge her at all. That's what the text says. He doesn't acknowledge her at all. <clears throat> then the disciples, they rush up to Jesus and they beg him to send her away, to cast her aside because she's making an unsightly scene after all. And when Jesus responds, it is to affirm his identity, his identity as the son of God, as the son of David, as the leader <clears throat> and the Messiah in the house of Israel. This woman, this outsider, she affirms his identity too, calling him Lord. In some translations, also calling him the son of David and begs again for his help. And that's when Jesus addresses the woman directly for the first time, basically comparing her to a dog, something less than human. This scene has always troubled me since the first time that I read it for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want to believe that Jesus would talk to someone that way, especially someone who was hurting like that. I also don't want to believe that even for a second that Jesus thought that he only came to save a portion of humanity. The way I see it, a couple of things could be going on here. The first is the situation could have played out literally as it is described with Jesus himself leaning in to the cultural dynamic between the two people groups, fully intending to withhold healing from the Canaanite woman's daughter. And that being the case, then it would have been the woman's faith that served as a catalyst for a change of heart of the Messiah of Israel himself. The other is that Jesus could have been allowing the scene to play out along the lines of cultural norms to a point, to make a point, to begin to reveal what he knew all along, that the wholeness that he offers is available to everyone, regardless of the distinctions and the labels that we place upon ourselves, even amid centuries of deep-seated conflict. Either way, this scene is a teachable moment, and it is the faith of the Canaanite woman, despised, rejected, dehumanized, that is the teacher. She is standing literally face to face with Jesus, with her daughter's sanity, even her daughter's very life on the line. And when the woman gets pushed back, she pushes back with an argument not of her goodness, not of her deservedness, but of the strength of the power of Jesus, the strength and the power of the mercy and grace and healing that Jesus offers. Even dogs eat crumbs that fall from the table, she says. In other words, just a speck 
of your grace and mercy will do. Jesus honors her faith. Her daughter is healed. And in reading and learning from this, we have the opportunity, sisters and brothers, to learn something that could save us quite a bit of heartache in this world. The good news is this. Our spiritual journey is not about whether we are right or wrong. Our spiritual journey with Jesus, as Jesus is saving us, is about what we can learn together as we have faith, as we engage in grace and mercy. Sisters and brothers, our spiritual journey is not about whether we are right or wrong. It's about what we can learn together on this journey as we offer grace and mercy, as we have faith together. Of course, to avoid the heartache that I mentioned above, we must be willing to have a change of heart, to have a change of mind. Honestly, a willingness to change, even though that is not our favorite word, a willingness to change is what makes faith an experience of discovery. It makes faith a journey in the first place. So this is our fourth week on our summer road trip, and we have been discovering spiritual journey travel tips along the way. If you've missed those sermons, you can go back to YouTube or Facebook and watch all of them. But the first travel tip is this. Choose your travel companions wisely. The second travel tip is this. Be willing to be affected and moved to action by what you see and experience on the journey. Tip number three is go to the source of what you've heard and see for yourself. Go to the source. That's exactly what the woman in our text did for today as she crossed all kinds of barriers to do so. And in that, she exhibited travel tip number four, keep an open mind. Keep an open mind. Now this tip actually works both ways in our story today. The woman kept an open mind that Jesus, the Messiah of another people group, would give her the time of day and would heal her daughter. And Jesus kept an open mind too. At the very least, if his mind was already open, he modeled for the disciples what it means to keep an open mind, even in the crosshairs of a culture war. Sisters and brothers, I don't know a text that is any more relevant for us today. From our global interactions to our interpersonal interactions to the inner workings of our minds, the inner workings of our hearts and our souls. That's where all interaction begins anyway, right? That day many years ago, when I hung up the phone, after denying my loved one's request to meet, as I said, I immediately regretted it because I had this full conversation in my head within seconds, recognizing that reconciliation was within my reach. And it didn't have anything to do with my goodness. It didn't have anything to do with my deservedness. It had everything to do with the grace and the mercy that Jesus offers. So I picked up the phone. And I dialed that number that I knew by heart. And I said, can I change my mind? Can I change my mind? Sisters and brothers, it's a powerful question. It's the first step to reconciliation on any level. And it begins with admitting just the possibility that we could be wrong about something or about someone. And I know that that seems like a small thing when you look at the scale of turmoil that we are experiencing right now in the world. But I do not think that I can overemphasize to you the power of humility. So as we prepare this morning to move toward a celebration of the Sacrament of Holy Communion, I invite us each to take some time to ask ourselves, could I be wrong? Do I need a change of heart? Do I need to rethink my approach or my stance or my behavior in some area of my life? Could I 
be wrong. Sisters and brothers, honest and humble answers to these questions can bring us to the point of confession, which then can lead us to forgiveness and reconciliation by the grace of God. And that is what we celebrate at the communion table. That is what we celebrate at the table of Christ in the sacrament. It's also why I believe a willingness to change our minds is the first step to changing the world. A willingness to change our minds is the first step toward changing the world. And maybe that doesn't make the work that is left to be done seem any less overwhelming to us, but it does make that work doable one step of the journey at a time. Amen? Amen. Sisters and brothers, as I said earlier, we will move now into a celebration and a recognition of the Sacrament of Holy Communion. And so last week we made available pre-packaged consecrated elements to the people in our community in El Paso. If you are not able to pick those up, don't worry. Please stay here at the table. Grace is available to all of us. If you do have these elements, I invite you to get those out as we prepare to share the table together. And we will always make the communion elements available in some form. And so if you would like to participate with the prepackaged elements or whatever form of elements we provide next month, know that that will be available for you. So I invite you now to take a deep breath. As we recognize once more in our practice of Holy Communion, we Methodists recognize that God's table is open to everyone. We are not casting crumbs here. Each piece of bread has the full power of the entire loaf, the full power to bring healing and wholeness from brokenness. From each drop of the cup of salvation, the full power of healing flows. Every time a person crowds around the table, every time another person crowds around the table, the table itself grows, making room for each new person without a speck of judgment and with an abundance of unending grace and mercy. It is at this table that hearts can be changed, that our hearts can be changed again and again when we are willing to change our minds, when we are willing to admit that we could be wrong about something or someone. And that is what our prayer of confession is about. That's why we pause in our celebration of the sacrament every time to admit the things that we have done wrong, not just in our actions, but in the postures of our hearts. And so we're going to take a moment of silence to offer our individual and corporate prayers of confession now. Let us pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers, such confession orients our hearts again to open and openly and fully receive God's grace and mercy so that we will live differently because we recognize that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, sisters and brothers, you are forgiven. We are forgiven. Glory be to God. Amen. And that is why together we take the time to remember a few things about the upper room and the night that Jesus was with his friends. It was on that night as they celebrated the Passover meal that Jesus took bread that looked much like this. But he did something new with it. He gave thanks for it. He blessed it. 
And then he broke it. And he gave it to his friends. And he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. Take, eat, do so in remembrance of me. And in a similar manner, when the supper was over, he took a cup filled with wine. He blessed it. And he gave it to his friends and he said, this is my blood and it's a new covenant. And it's poured out for you and for everyone for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, remind us again this morning that your table is open to everyone. It is a table of unity. It is a table of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Jesus identified himself. It is a table of communion with the earth in which Jesus became incarnate in the flesh. It is a table that stretches beyond the physical limitations of this world, allowing us to be seated together in this moment, in this holy meal. May we all come to this table, those of us who have much faith and those of us who would like a little bit more, and those who have not been here for a long time, may we who hunger for even the scraps from your table accept your full gift of grace, be nourished in the fullness of salvation and wholeness that you offer as you meet us here in this sacred moment. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the body of Christ is broken for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Thanks be to God. In this live moment of God's grace, may you recognize once again that we who are many our one body, redeemed by the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, thank you so much for joining me today. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may this sacrament of Holy Communion remind us once again of your presence and of your saving grace, not just once, but every moment of our lives. Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds to the ways that you are calling us to grow and to change, to more fully pursue your mission in this world. For your never-ending pursuit of us and the grace that you offer, we give you thanks. Amen. Again, we're going to link to some information about the live streamed prayer vig vigil and celebration of healing and wholeness today that's taking place in our city. We'll put that in the comments so that you can access that and know that we will continue to work together to seek God's justice, to proclaim God's mercy, and to learn to live in wholeness and fullness even amid the brokenness of the world and in ourselves. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you would abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of our God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer who loves us very much. Amen. Be at peace. <laughs>